Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. We're currently reading and discussing the book Code Word Barbalon, book two of the two-book series by P.D. Stewart, subtitled Antichrist is a Woman Alive and Well Again. We've advanced to chapter 60 of the book, which begins on page 415. And at the end of the broadcast last time, we were talking about statements made by Avril Manhattan in his book entitled The Vatican in World Politics, where he cited that the Roman Catholic Church was going to take over America through social justice, a buzzword used by a Roman Catholic priest back in the 1930s, a very popular Roman Catholic priest named Father Coughlin, they called him, and his social justice policies are simply Roman Catholic social doctrine. And it's the same Roman Catholic social doctrine uh, uh, preached by Father Coughlin that Barack Obama preaches. And he, get, Avril Manhattan gives a quote <clears throat> in his book, and we read it last time, but we, for review purposes, I'll read it again. He says, Father Coughlin had thousands of readers of his paper, Social Justice, and millions of listeners to his broadcasts. What did he preach? He simply preached the kind of authoritarianism combined with a mixture of fascism and Nazism harmonized. He bore in mind that the country in question was the United States of America. Father Coughlin, in fact, tried to use non-Catholic elements, that is, Protestant elements, or any other element not Catholic, and I will interject, he even used Freemasonry, but nonetheless, he names one of these non-Catholic elements, which nevertheless had in common with Catholicism, and with him the same hatred of certain things and the same goals in social and political matters. By skillful maneuvering, he managed to secure a majority control, a majority control, 80% of America First, an, organized, an, an organization formed mainly by supranationalist elements and business magnates. Unquote. Father Coughlin's influence on Depression-era America was enormous. Millions of Americans listened to his weekly radio broadcast on social justice. Don't forget, social justice is just another name for Marxism, which is just another name for, for Roman Catholic social doctrine. It is said that, quote, at the height of his popularity, one-third of the nation was, turned, was tuning into his weekly broadcasts. In the early 1930s, Coughlin was arguably one of the most influential men in America. Note, therefore, that like Coughlin, President Barack Obama is big on social justice and even has a department called Social Justice Ministry for Obama. His own pre-election website states, quote, Social Justice Ministry is a group for people of all faiths. In other words, it's ecumenical, right? Uh, uh, it's a group of people of all faiths and beliefs ready, willing, and able to come together and elect Senator Obama as the next president of the United States, unquote. Now, beginning where we left off last time, bottom of page 416, the last couple lines if you're following along. In a September 6, 2001 interview with Chicago Public Radio, WBEZ 91.5 FM, on the Odyssey program hosted by Gretchen Felrick, Obama endorsed, listen to this, redistributive change and spoke of the Supreme Court's failure to take on, quote, the issues of redistribution of wealth 
and of more basic issues such as political and economic justice in society, unquote. Obama said that he wants to, quote, spread the wealth around, unquote, but could only do so if America breaks free of the essential constraints that were placed by the founding fathers in the Constitution, unquote. Good grief. We have just read Mr. Obama saying that he wants to radically reinterpret the Constitution of America by removing its quote-unquote essential constraints in order to be able to redistribute wealth. So Barack Obama wants to use the Supreme Court to reinterpret the Constitution of the United States, which is the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, to interpret the Constitution. Barack Obama wants to use the Supreme Court of the United States of America to, to reinterpret the Constitution to make it legal to redistribute wealth. In other words, take from the rich and give to the poor. In other words, give wealth to those who have not earned it. To take from those who have earned it and give it to those who have not earned it. Does this, does this uh, make any more sense to you about the uh, health care program that's, that Barama, Barack Obama is all about? It's called the redistribution of the United States wealth. To take from workers and give to those who do not work. Redistribution of wealth. And don't forget, this is Roman Catholic social policy. The Pope has declared himself the world's Robin Hood, and he's going to take from, while Barack Obama takes from wealthy Americans and gives to those who don't have not earned it, the Pope has a much larger role. He takes from the rich nations of the world and gives to the poor, pagan nations of the world. Who are the wealthy nations in the world? Protestant nations, aren't they? Britain and the United States. And where is this Protestant wealth going? To pagan nations. This is an attack on Protestantism. It's cloaked in a buzzword, a Roman Catholic buzzword called social policy, social doctrine. Call it whatever you will, it's Marxism. And it is an attack on Protestantism, the ultimate target of every effort made in this country by the papacy is to undermine the foundations of Protestantism. And isn't that what the Jesuit order is all about? Are you beginning to comprehend just how much influence the Jesuit order and the Roman Catholic hierarchy have in Washington, D.C.? And don't forget, they've now achieved, that is, the Roman Catholic hierarchy in this country have now achieved a super majority of Roman Catholics on the Supreme Court, that institution put in place to interpret the Constitution. A supermajority, six to three, Roman Catholics, and there isn't one single Protestant on that Supreme Court. Now, continuing what the author says, thus Obama's goal for America is to break free of the, quote, constraints that were placed by the founding fathers in the Constitution, unquote, to achieve, quote-unquote, social justice, as proposed by the popes, by means of a redistributive wealth. But as Wes Pruden of the Washington Times observes, quote, to redistribute wealth, you first have to confiscate it from those who earned it with hard work. And the way to do that is with confiscatory taxes. Then you give it to those who didn't earn it, unquote. 
Here is reasoned audacity, reader, the audacity of Barack Obama. These facts betray who Barack Obama's true God is. You know, you see all this debate. Is Barack Obama a Christian? Is he a Muslim? What is Barack Obama? Again, I'll repeat what I said the other day. Barack Obama can profess any religion so long as he, so long as he obeys the Pope. And that's what he's doing. Now, continuing with the book, it says, As someone in the know once said, quote, The Democratic Party can never capture the government except by agreeing beforehand and in secret to do more for the Roman Catholic Church. Unquote. Why, you ask, is Barack Obama's position on social justice and redistribution of wealth significant? And how is it connected to Rome? I would refer you to the later chapter title, The Pope and the Universal Destination of Your Goods, and we'll get to that surely in this book. But let me say here that we have enough evidence that Mr. Obama, President Obama, is a Marxist. Proof? Dr. John C. Drew is a grant writing consultant in Laguna Niguel, California. He told Newsmax that he first met Obama in 1980 when the latter was still a sophomore at Occidental College, Los Angeles. At the time, Dr. Drew had just graduated from Occidental and was undertaking graduate studies at Cornell University. He says that during one Christmas break, he was at the home of his girlfriend in Palo Alto, California, when the young Barack Obama came over with a friend of his, Hassan Chandu. Quote, Barack and Hassan showed up at the house in a BMW, and then we went to a restaurant together, Drew says. For the next several hours, they discussed Marxism, Drew recalls. Quote, he was arguing a straightforward Marxist-Leninist class struggle point of view, which anticipated that there would be a revolution of the working class. It anticipated that there would be a revolution of the working class by, led by ideological revolutionaries who would overthrow the capitalist system, and institute a new socialist government that would redistribute the wealth, unquote, Drew revealed. Drew says at the time he was himself also a Marxist. As we read a few paragraphs earlier in, 2000, in a 2001 radio interview, Barack Obama expressed regret that the Supreme Court had not reinterpreted the United States Constitution so as to permit a, redistribu a redistribution of wealth. Obama has said he sees the Pope as his quote-unquote ally, and that, quote, he has been profoundly affected by Roman Catholic social teachings, unquote. Catholic social teaching is Marxism which today is called social justice. Intelligent reader communism was created by the Vatican. Jesuit scholar Oswald von Nelbrenning confessed as much when he told his fellow Jesuits, quote, We are all standing on the shoulders of Karl Marx, but some of us are simply not aware of it, unquote. And Pope John Paul II once referred to the Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev as, quote, an obvious instrument of divine providence, unquote. To return to Avril Manhattan's book, we read on page 129, quote, Father Coughlin and the leaders of this movement had already made plans to transform America first by amalgamation of members with a million of his radio followers into a mighty political party, a kind of private army which was screened behind the formation of the Christian Front. On more than one occasion, Father Coughlin stated that he would seek power even by violent means, as, for instance, when he declared, quote, 
rest assured, we will fight you Franco's way, unquote. From the work Social Justice, quoted by J. Carlson. And on page 130 of the 1957 book, and page 385 of his 1949 work, Avril Manhattan quotes Father Coughlin as follows, quote, We predict that the National Socialists of America, organized under that or some other name, eventually will take control of the government on this continent. We predict, lastly, the end of democracy in America, unquote. That from Father Coughlin in his work, in his periodical Social Justice, issued September 1st, 1939. Avril Manhattan asks, quote, Could there be a more outspoken hint of what Father Coughlin and his non-Catholic associates would do if they had the opportunity to develop their plan? These tactics had within a few years rallied behind Father Coughlin, a popular following of 15 million Americans. The groundwork for the launch of a full-blooded fascism in North America had been successfully done. With the blessing of the Vatican, the money of the big dinosaurs, the corporations, and the support of a great proportion of the American masses, there was now initiated an even clearer design the conquest of the President of the United States, unquote. And isn't this what John F. Kennedy tried to tell the American people? That there's someone trying to take over the, offices of, the office of President of the United States, and before I leave office, I'm going to tell the American people who it is. And only day later, days later, he, let, he, he, he uh, lay on a stretcher in the hospital in Dallas after having been slain by his own church. Now the author continues, that is to have control of the President of the United States, or better yet, have their chosen men elected as presidents. I would not be the least surprised if Barack Obama is their quote-unquote change agent and that Bush and Clinton were forerunners preparing the way for Obama. That's just the short list. It began much sooner than that. It began with Ronald Wilson Reagan, the one who formally reopened diplomatic relations with the Vatican and simply handed this country to the Pope on a silver platter. At least from Ronald Wilson Reagan... The Vatican has had her way in Washington, D.C. Now, continuing, he says, Anyway, what did Catholic priest Coughlin mean by all of this talk about communism and fascism being foisted on America? The illustrious General Lafayette, a companion of fellow soldier of, the America's, of America's first president, George Washington, explained, listen carefully, quote, if ever the liberty of this republic is destroyed, it will be by Roman priests, unquote. And I'll interject that that's the same thesis brought forward by Charles Jinnicky and also by Secretary of the U.S. Navy R.W. Thompson. They were prophets in their own right. Now, in the Founding Father of America, Washington warned, quote, we lay it down as an incontrovertible truth that Catholic European nations are determined to plant their institutions among us until they reduce this free and enlightened republic to the dominion of the Holy See, unquote. Preposterous, you say? Here's the proof. It is the oath found in Catholic canon law taken not only by archbishops and bishops, but by all who receive any dignity of the Pope. And you might assert that this would include a President of the United States, particularly if it was a, a, a candidate picked to run for President of the United States by the Pope himself. Now here's the oath that every Roman Catholic priest takes. I, and then he states his name, 
elect of the church, and then he names the church, from henceforward will be faithful and obedient to St. Peter the Apostle, which is just another way of saying the Pope, and to the Holy Roman Church, and to our Lord the Lord, and then he names the name of the current Pope, and to his successors canonically coming in, the counsel of which they shall instruct and trust me with all by themselves their messengers or letters I will not knowingly reveal to any to their per, their prejudice. I will help them to defend and keep the Roman papacy and the royalties of St. Peter, saving my order against all men. The rights, honors, privileges, and authority of the Holy Roman Church of our Lord the Pope and his aforesaid successors, I will endeavor to preserve, defend, increase, and advance. I will not be in any council, action, or treaty in which shall be plotted against our said Lord and the said Roman Catholic Church anything to hurt or prejudice of their persons, right, honor, state, or power. And if I shall know any such thing to be treated or agitated by any whatsoever, and I will include Inquisition update, I will hinder it to my uh, I will hinder it to my power, and as soon as I can, I will signify it to our said Lord, or to some other by whom it may come to his knowledge. Heretics, schismatics, and rebels to our said Lord or his aforesaid successors, I will to my power persecute and oppose, unquote. That's a declaration of open warfare to anyone who would stand in the way of the papacy implementing his policies in this country. Anyone speaking out against the papacy, anyone... And now you know why God's people have been persecuted throughout the centuries. This is the basis for all the malicious interference that I am subjected to every night on amateur radio. Wholesale, widespread, government-sponsored, malicious interference of my transmissions on amateur radio. I'm being denied my First Amendment rights to tell the American people what's going on in this country and who's responsible for it. Every Roman Catholic has a duty to his Pope to interfere with my lawful transmissions, my lawful exercise of my First Amendment rights on amateur radio. And the government, the Federal Communications Commission, won't lift a finger to stop it. Neither will the Amateur Radio Relay League. This is why I'm calumniated, threatened, and persecuted everywhere I go. But I'm going to keep telling the truth until God takes my last breath. I know what's wrong with America. P.D. Stewart knows what's wrong with America. It's Roman Catholic canon law. It's the priests that parade up and down the streets of Washington, D.C. and New York and control this country. The writers of history were correct. The Protestant reformers were correct. P.D. Stewart was correct, and I'm correct, that if the American people don't wake up, we're going to lose this country, and we're going to lose Protestantism. But I want to ask you the question. If you were paying attention before the break when I read this oath, remembering that every Roman Catholic priest takes this oath, or anyone who has received a benefit or a dignity from the Pope takes this oath, that could be the President of the United States, and I assert it is the Presidency of the United States. Not only the current President, Barack Hussein Obama, but every President before him, up to at least and including Ronald Wilson Reagan. And that makes these people enemies of the state. 
That makes these people emissaries of the Pope of Rome. They're not Americans, they're Papists. And their design is to destroy our Protestant Constitution and replace it with Roman Catholic canon law. To replace a duly elected President of the United States by the people of this country to a hand-picked stooge for the Pope. And that's what they've done. That's what they've accomplished. That's why nobody can make sense of what's happening in this country. Why? You mean to tell me the Pope's got that much power? Yep. That's what I'm telling you. That's what P.D. Stewart's telling you. And we can stick our heads in the sand and deny it's true while the, f the, the papal freight train just runs right over us. There's an inquisition coming to this country, the likes of which we cannot even comprehend unless we've read Fox's Book of Martyrs, unless we've read the writings of the Protestant Reformers, unless we know some history about the Waldenses, the Huguenots, the Hussites, the Lollards, the Anabaptists, and all the slain of the earth at the hand of the popes of Rome. Barack Obama is the change agent of the papacy. He wants to redistribute your wealth and give it to those who, play, who pledge their allegiance to the Pope. That's what's happening in this country. We're going to have a global religion. Now, you can be a Heinz 57 religious mutt. They don't care what church you belong to as long as it serves the papacy as long as it serves the Pope's agenda for this once Protestant land. Did you comprehend what is written in this oath? They're not Americans. They're Roman Catholic fifth column. We would stand a better chance against foreign navies at our shores with guns blazing. But our enemy is within, and now it has become the majority of the population of this country. If you, can, if, if you consider the fact that these bishops and priests of Rome who have taken this oath now claim themselves to be the spiritual heads and leaders of all the ecumenical evangelical bellies that have signed... Uh, tentative agreements to to come into full communion with the Roman Catholic cult. So now we're not just talking about 25% of the population. We're talking about an overwhelming majority that the Roman Catholic priest can now walk into Congress, can walk into the Supreme Court with a paper in their hand, shaking their fists and saying, they're on our side. All these ecumenical evangelical bellies are on our side. We now represent them, not only just Roman Catholics, but non-Roman Catholics too. We have a moral, uh, we have a moral majority. We have a moral mandate, and you must kowtow to our authority. We control the press. We control the banks, we control Congress, we control the White House, and we're going to control this Supreme Court. And to prove it, there's a, a super majority of Roman Catholics on the Supreme Court. They've made America Catholic. That's what they've done. And now the Pope's going to do what he does all over the world. He's going to redistribute your wealth. And then he's going to lop off your head for not paying attention. All of it is commensurate with Roman Catholic canon law. This social doctrine that Barack Obama is promoting in this country, straight out of Roman Catholic canon law. He's taken this oath that's right out of Roman Catholic canon law. And commenting on this oath of canon law, Beginning in the first full paragraph on page 420, commenting on this oath of canon law, 
Dr. Wiley, that is James A. Wiley, the Protestant preacher, reformer, and writer and historian, wrote, quote, were Lucifer to turn legislator and indict a code of jurisprudence for the government of mankind, he would find the work done already and his hand in the canon law. He just suggested that Roman Catholic canon law would be exactly how Satan would take over this world if he chose to do it. He would just simply not reinvent the wheel. He would just use Roman Catholic canon law. And he says further, surveying the labors of his renowned servants with a smile of grim complacency, sorely puzzled what to alter, where to amend or how to enlarge with advantage, unwilling to run the risk of doing worse than his predecessors have done better, he, Lucifer, would wisely forego all thoughts of legislative and literary fame and be content to let well enough alone. In other words, just to, why, why reinvent the wheel? Just follow Roman Catholic canon law and the earth is mine and the fullness thereof. That's what James A. Wiley said about this oath and Roman Catholic canon law. He said, instead of wasting the midnight oil over a new work, Satan would confine his labors to the more useful, if less ambitious, task of writing a recommendatory preface to the Roman Catholic canon law. Unquote. On pages 148 through 156 of his work, The Roman Catholic Hierarchy by Thomas Edwards writes, quote, For years and years, the American priesthood, the Roman Catholic priesthood in America, has been preparing the minds of the people to take orders from Rome on matters political. For years and years, they have been concentrating their energies on America, for years and years, they have been steadily advancing on New York and Washington, two strategic points of the greatest importance. From the city of New York, the business world is controlled. From that great metropolis issue, the magazines and the newspapers of the largest circulation. From that city, the transportation companies uh, are controlled. He who rules New York City is the king of this nation. The financial interests of that city dominate those of all others. Wall Street expands and contracts the currency, precipitates panics and checks them, dictates governmental policies, overawes administrations, beats Congress into submission to its will, uses the national treasury as a as a branch bank of its own, compels the government to withdraw from circulation $150 million of its own gold, gets another mortgage on the republic whenever it needs one in its, in its business, and upon occasion can practically suspend the circulation of the nation's own money, send prices and fortunes crashing downward, while the President of the United States, the officers of the law, the Army and the Navy, and a nation of nearly 100 million people look helplessly on. With the colossal riches of the Roman Catholic Church at his command, and through the instrumentalities already indicated, the Roman Catholic hierarchy control American commerce, American politics, American legislation, American politics at home and abroad. And I will just add through the ecumenical movement, they even control the pulpit in this country. Body and soul, the papacy is in control of this country. That Rome has been preparing the minds of its people to accept her doctrine of supremacy in political affairs may be a startling fact to most of my readers, but it is easily proved, said Watson. Quote, At one time the Roman Catholics had no foothold in this country and no appreciable influence upon public affairs. At present they are powerful in all our cities and in the great West 
which will rule the future of this country, the Roman Catholics have grown enormously and almost have controlling numbers. We have members of our highest lawmaking body who consider it an honor to be allowed to kiss the foot of a man. Already we have members of the United States Supreme Court and one member of the cabinet who would feel incredibly elated at being given a Vatican audience in which they would humbly kneel before a man and touch his slippered foot with their devout lips. Already we have millions of people in America to whom the privilege of abasing themselves in the presence of a venerable Italian priest is an unattainable blessing for which they can only dream while they from a distance adore, unquote. Today in the second decade of the 21st millennium with 70 million registered residents in America already professing its creed, the United States has the fourth largest Catholic population in the world after Brazil, Mexico, and the Philippines in that order. The American Republic will soon belong completely to Rome. It is the determined intention of the Roman Catholic hierarchy to capture the presidency, and this they have done. From Presidents Ronald Wilson Reagan, Bush, father and son, Clinton, and now Obama, all have been influenced by Rome's hidden, insidious, and democratically subversive social doctrines. As Watson commented, quote, in the United States, political Romanism is sweeping all before it. Unquote. Quoting further says, the American people must be very blind indeed, wrote former ch uh, priest uh, Charles Jenicky, if they do not see that if they do nothing to prevent it, the day is very near when the Jesuits will rule this country from the magnificent White House in Washington to the humblest civil and military department of this vast republic. Unquote. What then is the literal fact, asked Watson? He answers himself, quote, While we Protestants are reaching out after Cuba, Jamaica, and South America, Rome is conquering North America. We are annually losing to her in the United States enormously more than we take from her in all the other Roman Catholic countries put together. Why not, Italy, why not let Italy remain Roman Catholic? and Cuba remain Roman Catholic, and South America remain Roman Catholic, until we have called home all our workers, concentrated all our enemies, our, our, enemy, our, our energies, concentrated all of our energies, and put Roman Catholicism to rout in our native land. Put the Roman Catholics to rout! Root them out. Don't elect them. Don't go to their churches. Don't pay their tithes. Expose these Roman Catholic priests as emissaries of the Pope. Hostile to this once Protestant land. Where's the courage of God's saints? Are we afraid to offend somebody? Trust me, we are about to be offended. It's offensive to lop off the head of a godly man. And that's what's going to happen in this country. From shore to shore, from border to border, God's people, the Bible-believing Christians in this country, the slumbering saints of God will be asleep when their heads are lopped off and they'll be looking around wondering, why? Who's responsible for this? Well, I'm telling you, Rome's preparing to take your head. You either join this ecumenical movement to raise the papacy to world supremacy or off with your head. And Barack Obama is the Pope's change agent, just as was Ronald Wilson Reagan, George H.W. Bush, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, and now Barack Obama. The Pope 
picks the president of this country. And Protestantism, Bible-believing saints of God are the target. The Bible is the target. The quote continues, What shall it profit us to redeem South American republics and lose our own? The greatest mission field in the world today is the United States of America. She's gone Romeward. Going back to the scarlet harlot. There's no more spiritual blindness anywhere in the world than the United States of America. And our ignorance and lethargy and faithlessness and fearfulness is going to cost us our head. We're going to pay the ultimate price. When Israel wouldn't stand up to the priests of Baal, they went into Babylonian captivity, and that's exactly what's going to happen in America. Well, I've just been informed that I got a false cue, apparently. So I will continue reading and discussing the book Code Word Barbalon by P.D. Stewart. It says, But the proud, sport-drunk, over-entertained Americans are still saying it can't happen here. P.D. Stewart has laid out a thesis so watertight that no one could raise a credible argument. Rome has taken over this country. And he's done it while the proud, sports-drunk, over-entertained Americans are still saying it can't happen here. And you know, that's my own personal experience. When I talk about these things on amateur radio, I'm met with, at best, at the very best, I am met with skepticism and incredulity. I mean, the consensus is, well, this man must be just an anti-Roman Catholic bigot. He must have been molested by a priest. He's got an agenda against the Roman Catholic Church. He's not credible. And, of course, I lay out all the historical and biblical facts to uh, uh, bolster my assertions. And they just dismiss that. It goes right over the tops of their heads. And when I ask them for an argument, they simply call me names. That's all they want to do is call me names. And the best one that they call me, the least harmful one they call me, they call me a troublemaker. <laughs> a troublemaker. No. No, I'm not a troublemaker. You don't shoot the messenger. The troublemaker's in Rome. He has multiplied his troublemaking status for nearly 2,000 years in this world. No, I have far more credibility than he does, and I back it up with facts and quotes Scripture and history. It's time for the proud, sports drunk, overly entertained, biblically and spiritually illiterate Americans to wake up to the fact that it can and it has already happened here. Now, the author continues in chapter 61. This is probably one of the most important chapters in this book. It's entitled, Make America Catholic. It begins with a quote from William O. Douglas, Supreme Court uh, Justice. As nightfall does not come at once, neither does oppression. In both instances, there is a twilight that everything remains seemingly unchanged. And it is in such twilight that we all must be most aware of change in the air, however slight, lest we become unwitting victims of the darkness. Unquote. 
And let me tell you, the darkness of this world comes from the church of darkness, the Roman Catholic Church. The author begins by saying, make America Catholic. It's the slogan that has been publicly proclaimed, quote, at monster Romanist gatherings, unquote, said Watson. Dr. Chapman told us in his book, and I confirm it to be true in book one of Code Word Barbalon, that the Roman Catholic Knights of Columbus have as their slogan, capital M, capital A, capital C, MAC, meaning Make America Catholic, by fair means or foul. Yes, Make America Catholic, that's their slogan. And then they go out to conquer. According to our Sunday visitor, an official journal of the Roman Catholic Church in America, quote, it is the duty incumbent on us as Catholics to spread the word to make America Catholic. It is the goal of every bishop, priest, and religious order in American in, in the American country. Unquote. Americans, Rome intends to lay the heavy hand of a Catholic state upon your great country and crush out the life-giving democratic principles of Protestantism from America. And let me just add, the worse yet, to take the Word of God out of this country. Because that is the only effective defense and offense that God's people have against this Roman horde. It's the only defense Jesus used against Satan when he was tempted in the desert 40 days. And if you take away God's Word out of this country, it will come crashing down of its own weight. And you throw the weight of the Roman Catholic Church on top, and what you've got left is a Roman Catholic super state, and the river's running red blood, blood red with the, the blood of the martyrs. History is about to repeat itself in this country. The author continues, he said, you'll find full proof of this assertion in the book, American Presidential Campaigns and Elections. And he cites this book, the author of which, uh, uh, the full title of which is Congressional Record, Proceedings and Debates of the United States Congress, page, uh, let's see, do I have the right, uh, no, here it is, William G. Shade et al., American Presidential Campaigns and Elections, you can get it, uh, get this from the Congressional Record, January 28th, 1928, First Session, 70th Congress, Volume 69, Part 2, 19, uh, 1654. Anyway, the citation is given in the book. That's why it's so valuable to get this book. Anyway, he says, you'll find full proof of this assertion in the book, American Presidential Campaigns and Elections. But I guarantee you, that were you to write to any Roman Catholic politician or leader asking questions relative to the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church, which conflicted with the Constitution of the United States, they will not answer your question, but will evade each point and respond to you in a manner as if the teachings and workings of the Roman Catholic Church was above reproach and ought not to be questioned." So that's the challenge, my readers, to the next time. Question your Roman Catholic politicians. Ask them how much of their beliefs contradict the Constitution of the United States. How much does their church contradict the Constitution of the United States? They won't answer you. We'll do it again tomorrow on Inquisition Update.